let's go! LSU, Texas A&M. Are we recording? Oh, yeah, we're recording, baby. We're outside, baby. Let's go. Is LSU going to shock everyone and go to College Station and ruin Texas A&M's dream season? Hey, the Yankees have paid Jimbo Fisher so much money for what up to this point? So this is Texas A&M's year. Can LSU spoil the party? We're going to investigate this game from all angles. Are you kidding me, Vegas? Not giving LSU a chance? A 12 and a half point spread? 6 p.m. kickoff on ESPN. And yeah, this is hopefully going to be a very good game for LSU. I hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. Let's go. I'm thankful for you, Power Hour LSU. Let's go. TJ Finley, game winning drive. Can they continue what they put together last week? And the answer to that is, I'm a little skeptical. Yes, LSU ran the football effectively, but that doesn't mean that they ran the football spectacularly. It's two completely different things. They gave Ty Davis Price and Chris Curry quite a few touches, and they... But Ty Davis Price played well, 24 carries, over 100 yards, but no real long run. So they were able to... Nickel and dime, they were good on third down. They were able to move the chains. But the LSU offensive line was going up against a defensive line of Arkansas who was playing with mostly backups due to the pandemic. And the LSU offense had all this time to prepare. T.J. Finley, with an extra week to prepare against South Carolina, was spectacular. With not the extra week to prepare against Auburn, wasn't quite as good. With all the extra time to prepare against Arkansas, spectacular again. Can he do it on a short week, basically, here, or a shorter week, your normal seven week, against Texas A&M on the road on primetime television? We'll have to wait and see. Can Ty Davis Price replicate what he did last week, not only in the running game, but also in the passing game and in pass protection? And can the LSU offensive line play even better against a defense that has been pretty solid? And this is the biggest key of the game. The LSU defense continues to play poorly. But they were improved against Arkansas. Were they? I mean, yes, kind of, sort of, but not really. So LSU won the time of possession 42 to 18, okay? Basically meaning LSU had the football for three quarters compared to Arkansas's one quarter of, of possession, and Arkansas still outgained LSU. Now, don't get him. I'm happy LSU won, but that's just the truth. LSU got very lucky in that aspect. So what does that mean? Well, Arkansas, in the limited time, well, they were able to attack LSU down the field. Five of five, they were perfect throwing the football down the field. But Eli Ricks got ejected and Derek Singley Jr. got injured. Still hadn't stopped all the other offenses attacking LSU down the field the entire season. This is a systematic problem. But here's the stat that should concern you. Because when the SEC and defenses actually rank they go by the total yards per game, which is the wrong number to actually look at. You should look at yards per play because yards per play isn't affected by time. It is a play-by-play -play basis. LSU is historically bad at yards per play. 7.35, which is easily the worst in the SEC. Last year, the worst defense when it came to yards per play in the SEC was Vanderbilt. They weren't even over seven. In fact, they weren't even close to seven. So that's a huge problem when Vanderbilt is putting out a significantly better defense than you are. But Garter, nobody's stopping anybody in the SEC. I'm glad you mentioned that. It still doesn't take away that 7.35 yards per play is bad. And you have to factor this in. LSU this year has by far, and it's not even close, had the easiest start 
to the SEC season than any other team. In fact, the four best offenses are still left on LSU's schedule. So do some simple logic here, people. LSU's defense, which is by far the worst on a per-play basis, is now going up against the four best offenses. So they are historically bad while not facing the best offenses in the SEC. So do you think the LSU defense is automatically going to get better? You know, you as an LSU fan, me as an LSU fan would like to hope so, but it's probably not the case. Kellen Mond's better, 16 touchdowns, two interceptions, tons of yards. Spiller is not a spectacular running back, but he's pretty solid. Texas A&M's off its line's really good. They're not that great at receiver, but they are good at tight end. So, yeah, this could get ugly. It really could, especially now that all the advantages LSU had versus Arkansas, Texas A&M now has them, except they're at home and they're a better team than you are. So now let's point out some key players for this game. I'm going to go with Eric Gilbert. Remember in 2014, Leonard Fournette, as a true freshman, his first real coming out party was in College Station. Maybe the same thing is going to be true for Eric Gilbert. And I know his Missouri game was spectacular, but this could be the AG2 game where everyone sees that he's the next great thing. Now, for Texas A&M, the player I'm going to look for, actually I'm going to point out two, Buddy Johnson, their senior linebacker, where's number one? has 20 more tackles than anyone else on the team. I'm going to point out Jalen Wertermeyer, the Texas A&M tight end, who, in his own right, is a really good player. Last year, Jalen Wertermeyer had 30-plus catches. No other SEC tight end since 2009 as a true freshman had ever had 30 catches, and he's even better this year. For a coach, I'm going to point out Corey Raymond. Hopefully, uh, one day Corey Raymond gets his shot to call the plays. Because if Texas A&M lights up LSU, I believe Ed Orgeron should see if Corey Raymond could potentially be your next defensive coordinator. He doesn't know if Derek Singley Jr. is going to be completely healthy. Earlier in the week, Derek Singley Jr. was in the gold jersey. Hopefully he's going to be healthy and ready to go against Texas A&M. But even then, there have been three instances this year where Derek Singley Jr. Uh, has gotten hurt during the course of a game. Uh, earlier this year against Missouri, this last week against Arkansas, and right before the game began against Mississippi State, he's going to have to figure out who the other corner is going to be. Is it McLaughlin? Is it uh, Jay Ward? That's if Derek Stingley Jr. is healthy. Hopefully he's healthy, and if he's healthy, I like LSU's corners against Texas A&M's receivers because as great as their offense has been, their wide receivers aren't all that special. Now for prediction. And this prediction uh, is going to be pretty simple. LSU is a 12 and a half point underdog. I actually do think LSU will be able to move the football, but I think Texas A&M's offense is going to be reared up and ready to go. And, you know, so far we haven't seen the LSU defense make the proper adjustments uh, and, and they're still not there. So, with that said, I, I just think Texas A&M is going to not only win this game, I also think they will cover. I just don't see a scenario where LSU still struggles to make halftime adjustments. LSU still struggles defensively to stop deep passes. And this is all with the pass rush. But Kellen Mond, who hasn't run the ball all that well this year, is still more mobile than Felipe Frank. So your pass rush probably won't be as effective. You're playing a better offensive line, and you're playing against a more mobile quarterback. Still, I hope Andre Anthony, Ali Gay, and B.J. Ojolari continue their great play. So when you factor all of that in, I, I, I have to go Texas a and I hope that's not the case, but I'm here to give you honest analysis, okay? I'm thankful for a lot this Thanksgiving. I'm thankful that we had the team that we had last year. Subscriber shout out our Tristan Lee video, one of our most popular video and our recruiting videos still ill, like for real. So we will be producing a ton of recruiting content, including next week. 
Corey Foreman has his commitment date set for January 2nd. So I have more thoughts on that, and that will be coming up, obviously, next week. So uh, starting off here with Joel, I think we see a steady improvement in the next coming years in offensive line recruiting. And yeah, if Ed Orgeron decides to focus more and work harder on the offensive line, he's going to get more offensive linemen. And like we pointed out in the video, class of 2022 looks pretty good on the offensive line for LSU. And I really do think they're going to hit the JUCO market and transfer market hard this offseason. I still have a lot of cranberry sauce just kind of floating around in here. All right, here's Lawrence. We need a good name for the rivalry with Texas A&M. Only if it comes naturally. Don't force it. And look, this is coming from a guy who says the biggest rivalry is Arkansas and the Battle of the Golden Boot. And I know that's not the case for most of you, but it is for me growing up, uh, growing up in Arkansas. The truth of the matter will always be this way. LSU doesn't have a rival. They, they just don't. And part of that is because, well, there's no other in-state school. Alabama has Auburn, Ole Miss, and Mississippi State, the Egg Bowl, Florida, and what used to be, if it ever happens again, Florida State. You know, outside of Michigan and Ohio State, there's not really that many good rivalries between two schools that are, blah, 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 that are out of state. And let's be honest, we would just be faking it because Texas A&M's biggest rival will always be Texas, and it's a shame that they do not play every year. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. It's power, our, L-S-U, boom, 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 boom. Let me know what you think. I filmed this video uh, on my phone instead of my normal rig. Let me know if you noticed a, a difference. I know part of it was outside, but still.